Welcome to another episode of Life and Whiskey. As always, I'm Jordan, and uh, this is the ninth and final episode of the How to Hunt Elk Revisited series, where I'm giving you tips, tricks, things to think about, um, hopefully some things that help keep you safe. Um, and the whiskey I chose for this last one is John Bar Reserve Black Label. Uh, this is a blended scotch. Again, <clears throat> I didn't really do a ton of research into this. Um, so I really don't even have much to say about it. Um, let's see if I can find an age statement on this thing. Um, it's a 40% 80 proof, um, blended scotch. I don't know if you could hear that or not, but that was my stomach growling. Uh, still haven't eaten breakfast and... This is my ninth whiskey, so starting to feel it a little bit. Anyways, uh, I do not see an age statement on there. I didn't do a ton of research on it, so I don't have much to say about this. I'm just going to crack this open. We'll explore it, see it where it goes. Uh, I was able to pick up this $7.50 um, for $19.39, so it's on the budget end of uh, whiskeys, uh, especially scotch whiskeys. It's, it's, uh, it's a blended whiskey. Um... I don't even know what blends are in here, to be honest with you. I, it may say on the label, but I'm just not going to take the time to bore you guys um, with it. So, um, I figured I'd do a scotch. Last video we did some Irish. Uh, you know, just throwing some feelers out there, get outside the bourbon territory for a little while. Um, you know, trying to expand to make sure that I got all the categories covered here. So, so far we've done rye, wheat. Bourbon, Scotch, Irish, Canadian. So we got a good number of stuff uh, uh, so far if you look at all the different videos that I've put out so far. So um, <clears throat> let's see where this Scotch goes here. So it's uh, multi sweet on the nose, so it just has, as I've described in my other videos, it smells like Scotch. And that's what I'm getting out of it. It has a sweet note. A little bit of, um, I'm going to say, Barrel char, not not uh, not smoke really, but maybe it is. Um, I have to I have to get more scotches to be able to decipher which which smell I can associate with what exactly. But uh, it smells like to me. So all scotches, and I say it smells like scotch. It's the maltiness, but it's also if you've ever smelled the oak of a new oak barrel right so it, it's not charred at all it's just oak or if you've ever uh, you know cut firewood or something like that and the oak is extremely the wood is extremely extremely dry say it's like five or six years old already and you cut into it and it just smells like white oak that's that's what I get out of this so there's some oak in there there's some maltiness and it's sweet a little bit um that malty characteristic comes through kind of grass-like. <clears throat> it smells really good. Um, and as I said, when I first started this whole Life and Whiskey channel, I was not really a Scotch fan. I think I can throw that out the window. Um, it's not my go-to. It's not what I'm picking up when I just want to have a little bit of whiskey. But I definitely don't dislike it. And uh, it is. there are things I really do like. Uh, just on the smell, I would say that this smells very similar to Monkey Shoulder. So I reviewed that way back in the beginning of this channel. Um, it's it's along those same lines. Okay. The maltiness, the sweetness, all of that kind of gets... It's there, but it's very tamed down. It's very pushed aside. The um, the oak comes very, very forward. A hint of smoke or ash, I would say. Um, just a hint, you know, not dominating or anything like that. But like oak stave oak. I mean, when I say picture chewing on an oak stave, I think most people would understand what I'm saying. So a non-charred oak stave. Or if you, <laughs> this is going to sound weird. Have you ever, like when you were a kid or something, 
licked a wooden spoon when you were cooking or accidentally chewed, you know, bit down on it or something, and you get that, that wood flavor in your mouth, that oak, that's what, there's a, there's a lot of that from, like, the middle of this all the way through the finish. Then the finish dries out quite a bit. Um, for a 40 proof whiskey, like, I can feel some alcohol burn in my chest and my throat, um, which is a little bit surprising. The dryness, how dry this whiskey is, is kind of impressive as well. Um, I would say there's four or five flavors that come through on this, and I described most of them. The first two or three, you know, depending on how many you come up with, go extremely fast. And then the last, that oak really hangs on, that oak and ash really hangs on through the, the finish. So, Second sip, didn't change. It's pretty much exactly the profile as I described it before. This, I can see being a good back porch cigar sitting, kind of a whiskey, just enjoying the night. I would, personally... Um, I used to put scotch on the rocks. I can, and it definitely changes and opens things up, and I can see some that it would be really good. But I think um, to really enjoy this one, I would drink it um, just neat, neat pours. I think it would be really good. So, um, yeah, I am actually kind of digging this one. It, for me, I have to be in the mood to, to drink scotch, though. And, um, like, in the right setting, I'm on this all day long. So, for um, $19.39, I have no problem enjoying a pour of this. So, there you go. John Bar Reserve Black Scotch. Alright, so, that's all I got to say about that for the time being. Uh, I decided, I had a whole list of stuff. Boy, my stomach's really growling. Sorry about that. Um... I had a whole bunch of elk hunting tips, and it ended up being like, I don't know, eight, nine, ten different tips about, specifically about elk hunting, just like the last video. So I decided to break it up into two videos, since I had one more whiskey I needed to review anyways. Might as well tack, uh, you know, tack on a little bit of knowledge or life or whatever you want onto the whiskey review as well. So, picking up right where we left off um, with elk hunting tidbits. And so the first one I want to say is the sound of an elk versus the sound of a mule deer busting or running away or whatever. Um, so you will find when you are out in the mountains that animals tend to make a lot of noise. Um, and they also tend not to care that they are making a lot of noise while they are moving because they know that they can get away from whatever it is that they're, that, you know, presents danger. And when they need to move, that's what they do. They just go. Um, so, if you do not see an animal, if you hear animals bust, say they're just, you know, 30, 40, 50 yards in front of you in some thick cover and you hear some sounds, um, most often, not every time, but most often, if it is a mule deer, you will hear heavy, heavy, and I'm going to hit the table, um, and we'll see how it picks up on the microphone, but hopefully you hear, but you'll hear uh, heavy, so if you take the glass rattling out of that sound, that's what you'll hear, and what that is, is mule deer, when they bust, often, not always, you'll hear them, they'll do all four legs, and they'll jump, 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 so it's a really heavy bounding sound that you hear and often they'll only go 40 50 60 70 yards and then they will stop turn around and look at you because in most mountain areas the mule deer don't see humans every day and they don't really know what you are and if you're hunting properly you're coming into them from the downwind side so they didn't smell you so they don't really know what's going on um and so when you hear that heavy thump, 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 chances are that it is a mule deer that is busting from you. Now, you get into some of the high country muleys and stuff like that where the terrain's more open and that the deer, you know, a big, big mature buck, um, he's been around the block for a fairly long time. 
he's not going to stick around to find out what or who or where you are. He's just going to bolt. So that might, it may be a different story. That You might watch him, you know, say you're in a, a high country meadow and you watch him bolt. He might flat out run as fast as he can and instead of bounding run, you might, it may look like you could set a glass of water on their back and it wouldn't spill a drop because their body's level and their legs are just a going and they may, you know, you know, book it for the next county. They may go several miles before they stop. Um, but that's a security and experience thing. The bigger, more mature animals may do that, but most of the animals you encounter, I found, will do that bounding thing, uh, the mule deer anyways, and, and it's a distinct sound. Okay, so make sure that um, that you do uh, listen for that. In opposition to that, when an elk busts, it sounds like a horse or cattle or something running, right? It's a rah, 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 rah sound, you know, as their hooves are going and whatever. They're not bounding, they're running, and they're running that direction, right? So... And you can watch them jump six, eight foot tall down trees, no problem. Not even, not even questioning it. They break branches. They roll rocks. They, they smash through brush. They don't have to stick to an elk trail. Though I've watched elk just run right through the middle of a downed tree, no trail, no nothing. They're just like, that's my exit, and that's where I'm going. They don't care. Survival's the name of the game for them, and on the run. You know, their, their stride can be 20 feet sometimes. So, um, there's, a, there's a different sound, and where I'm going with that is I have fairly acute hearing. So, most of the time when I am hunting, the, the senses I use most often are sight or uh, smell and sound. And sound being the biggest one. I hear most animals walking I hear twigs snapping, I hear whatever. That's what I tend to key in on first to alert me to the presence of an animal. Um, my vision isn't always the best, and sense of smell, I'll probably touch on maybe in a second here. Let me... Yeah, very next one, we'll get into smell. So, um... There you go. Uh, definitely keep your ears open, uh, again, for branches moving and whatever else, or branches breaking and stuff like that. And if I haven't mentioned it before, I will mention it here, and I don't remember if I have or not because this is video number nine, but when you are moving point A to point B, if you are trying to get somewhere on the landscape, do not, you know, if you're a, an eastern whitetail hunter and you, and you are familiar with still hunting, don't do that to try and get, you know, if you got a half mile to cover, don't still hunt your way there. Just go. As long as the wind is in your favor, elk make a lot of sound when they move through the countryside. If you're bugling or calling or whatever, or even if you're quiet and you're moving, if they hear rocks rolling and twigs snapping and whatever else, they're just going to think you're another elk or another animal anyways. Um... I'm not saying go out of your way to make as much noise as possible. I'm just saying it's better that you cover that ground and get to where you're going than it is to, you know, slink your way there thinking you're going to be all stealthy and whatnot because chances are those elk are on the move anyways trying to get back to their bedding area and if they're a half mile ahead of you, they're going to stay a half mile ahead of you. It's really hard to gain ground on an elk on elk that are moving up the mountain going towards their bedding area if you're already behind them. So, you know, make it a point to get to where you're going. I know I've said slow down, slow down, slow down the last couple of videos. There are times where you need to go, and when you do, don't worry about the sound that you're making. If you have unnatural sounds, metal clinking, um, you know, straps flapping, things like that, clothes rustling, that kind of stuff may or may not. I don't, I can't say definitively whether or not that that is a problem. It would make sense if it was because it's an unnatural sound that the elk don't typically hear. But on the other hand, I've had experiences where weird sounds and elk don't seem to ma uh, care. So, uh, I'm not going to say one way or the other, but if I had to choose, it's best not to introduce those unnatural sounds um, as often as possible 
Um, but if you're making natural sounds, branches, twigs, ground, your, your boots just being on the ground, whatever, thump, 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 uh, that I have found does not really matter. So get where you, where you need to go. So there's that. So listen with your ears. Number two, I said hearing's number one. Smell for me. Smell's a good one. So <clears throat> yes, is our sense of smell anywhere near as good as any other natural animal? No, we have really crappy sense of smell. Um, but you can smell elk and you can smell them from a long ways away um, if you are in an area where they have just recently frequented you can smell the must of those elk in the air um, sometimes this can be problematic as you're like oh i can smell them right but it might just be their their scat their fecal matter from you know if you're on the edge of a meadow or something and they were feeding there all night and there's fresh elk scat out in the middle of that field and then the sun hits it and warms it up and now it's now you got this smell wafting over it um it may be that but that also tells you that you're in an area where they were recently okay so that is useful information but keep your nose open you will smell elk it's un it's not unmistakable because i will say sheep smell very similar to elk so if you run into the mountains and there's a herd of 500 sheep out there or if the sheep grazers have brought the herd through an area where you're hunting sheep and elk smell very similar and that can lead you astray but um it's kind of a, a musty barnyardy smell and once you figure out what that scent is use it to your advantage if you're upwind or Sorry, if you're downwind of the location of elk, you will smell them. So you let your nose help guide you in as well. It's it's a useful useful thing to keep your um, to use all your senses um, at the highest level possible to help you get into position and figure out what's going on. Um, and uh, just in general. Um, Elk communicate a lot. They're very noisy animals. So not only do they smell, and like I said, you can hear them moving and stuff, but they, they vocalize a lot. So, and all year round, right? Not just during the rut, but, you know, bulls bugle, cows can bugle. Um, they mew and chirp, and, you know, their alarm barks, and... They, um, you know, you hear their hoof beats on the ground. You hear twigs snap, roll, the rocks roll. The, the bulls, you know, they're raking in the brush. They're advertising. They're doing all these different things to make sounds. And it will help you figure out what's going on by A, figuring out what the sound is that you're hearing and what it means. And B, just hearing the sound to cue you into the fact that there are animals in a given location okay so sight and smell and sound the other thing is uh chris Rowe. you definitely want to check him out and i may have this wrong so definitely check out his uh row hunting resources website his app i carry i have his app on my phone it's amazing it does a great job of helping me out while i'm out in the woods if i hear an elk call i can look on my phone and go into the library and go, okay, here's the sound I made, here's what Chris says that sound means, and then a tactic um, operating around that sound and how to use it or how to understand what's being what's going on in the woods around me. Um, so check out his, you know, and he has some information on YouTube as well. And, of course, like everybody who does something that's paid, his YouTube stuff is... Uh, more towards a teaser because why would he give his valuable content away for free when he's trying to sell it okay so you can't blame the guy for that chris i've never really had too many you know, too much personal interaction with him but he's on facebook he seems like a really great guy every time i've commented or whatever and the interactions i've had with him have been awesome uh, I love watching his content on, on YouTube. It's really entertaining. I did subscribe to his webpage for a year. Extremely, extremely helpful. He really paints a great picture. And then in conjunction to that, I also use the Elk Nut um, app as well for the same exact reason. I think both of them have very good 
um, philosophies that kind of line up with one another. They're Chris's philosophy, and I forget the other guy's name, um, but their their philosophies are very, very similar. They're different enough that um, if you try one, there's still enough wiggle room in play that you can try the other one um, and maybe still get something to work. Um, and that's why I use both of their strategies is that they're in line with my way of thinking. Um, it seems to be more scientific or logically based um, approach to just wandering through the woods and randomly calling. So definitely check them out and realize that all the noises you hear mean something and have a purpose and can help you out um, as far as hunting if you get on it. So uh, according to Chris, and again, I'm saying this, but I might have it wrong because it's been a while since I watched the video, and like an idiot, I did not watch the video before making this video, but they want to um, see you first, hear you second, smell you third. That's how elk communicate. So elk originally were plains animals, wide open spaces. They have good vision. They want to see you. They're herd animals. Being in a herd, they can see each other. They know what's going on. So if they can't see you, the second thing they do is try and hear you. So if they can't see you, and um, they're going to try and get you to vocalize so that they can pinpoint your location and hear you. If they can't see you and they can't hear you, then the, the last thing they're going to do is try and circle where they think you are and smell, right? That's their last means of communication. So <clears throat> you can see how it's useful knowing that that's kind of the hierarchy of communication. And Chris's strategy is built upon that foundation and using that hierarchy to your advantage. So check them out. Um, he explains things incredibly well. He has a video that is on YouTube that's called Does It Matter? Something along the lines of like, does it matter if you know what you're saying when you're talking about elk? And he goes into an explanation of why he thinks it's important. And it is hands down the best explanation I've ever heard. Uh, the most logical and it's what really got me on board with his... Um, his philosophy of elk hunting and elk calling. So check, see if you can find that video. Just to, you know, go into YouTube and check out Row Hunting Resources and find the video that says something about does it matter what you're saying, something like that. So great video. So there you go. Um, <clears throat> number three. So we have you know hearing, smell. Number three, uh, as much as possible. Let your glass do the walking for you. Now, most of the areas that I have hunted in my seven years of elk hunting, binoculars have not done a whole hell of a lot of good for me. I'm not standing on top of a ridge somewhere being able to glass wide open meadows and whatever else for elk. That's just not the terrain that I find myself in. Maybe it's because everybody else sees that on YouTube and TV and go, that's where the elk are, so I must find that. And so they don't hunt the thick, nasty, deep canyons and whatever else that I seem to find myself in. But I will say, if possible, let that glass do the walking for you. So if, you're, if you find yourself on an opening and you can see a mile or two miles away, Glass that area from your present location before you decide you have to go over there. If you do find the elk somewhere other than your present location, okay, then burn the calories that it takes to get over there and go hunt over there. But just saying I need to get to point B because I saw it on a map, not the best strategy, especially if you have the option to walk there via glassing first and find out whether or not it's really worth your effort to go over there. Now, just because you don't see anything doesn't mean that it's not the right place to be. And also, if you are not finding elk in your current location, then yeah, great idea to just, you know, start, take a heading and pick a direction and start busting through country until you find the elk. But, you know, on day two or three or whatever of your elk hunt, if you have not found elk yet, <clears throat> your energy is going to be low. 
If you're not accustomed to the altitude, it's going to play a factor. Um, so instead of burning more calories, try and conserve your energy best you can and maybe take an afternoon. You don't have to do it all day, but take an afternoon. If you have a location that is beneficial to glass, do it. Um, so that's number three. Um, and number four <clears throat> might be a little controversial, but camel clothing is great and it works well. But it's not the magic fairy dust that's going to keep you from blowing up an elk herd if you hunt like an idiot. It's the same thing as scent-free products or any other number of products that are supposed to make you invisible to the elk. They don't work if you hunt like an idiot. So if you are upwind of elk, you're screwed no matter what you're wearing or how you do it. 100% guaranteed every single time. Not going to not gonna work out in your favor. Camel clothing. It, it is a benefit to have, but it doesn't solve all the problems of being a shitty hunter. Okay? And I've, I've talked to hunting guides. You know, there, there are plenty of people who hunt in solid colored clothing a pair of blue jeans and a cowboy hat and go out and are successful every single year. That is, the, just because you have camel clothing doesn't mean you can be dancing around like an idiot out in the woods and not playing the wind. It does, when used properly, have a huge effect, right? So, I'll tie into this your setup. Don't set up in cover or behind cover Right with you know, there's not a pine tree in front of me, and then the elk are over there, and then I have to figure out how to whatever. No, no, no. If I'm in cover, say these growlers are a tr are tree branches. I'm gonna set up right here. I'm gonna set up with that cover right behind me. My camouflage breaking up my silhouette against that cover is going to be the effective tool. That way I can watch that elk come in to my calling setup, the setup that I chose because I know I have the elk upwind, I have shooting lanes here, and the cover's thick enough that that elk has to look for me, okay? And so <clears throat> as that elk's coming in, I'm in front of my tree or my bush or whatever. Now it's up to me to make sure that I draw when that elk's eyes are obscured by something, okay? If they're walking straight at me and I just decide to draw, it may work out, but I'm gonna say the more, the majority of the time, 70% of the time, that elk's just gonna look at you and go, what the hell, turn around and run, okay? So you need to time your draw when you're archery hunting at the appropriate time. So their head needs to be behind a tree. If it's a bull that's bugling, you know, sometimes if you watch them, watch their eyes. Their eyes will roll back in their head and tip up to the sky while they bugle once in a while. If that's what's happening, draw then. If they're over raking a tree or something, again, they can see if their eyes are open and are pointed toward you. So make sure they're looking away from you or down or up or something. Draw when they're focused on something else, okay? You have opportunities along the way, but it's up to you to draw at the appropriate time. It's up to you to move and position yourself at the appropriate time to make that shot. Just because you're in camo doesn't mean that you're going to be able to do that. Okay? You still have to be a good hunter. Now, I'm not a great hunter. I feel like every year I'm getting a little bit better at it, but my first animal was nine yards. That's pretty up close and personal, and you have to do everything right to not blow that opportunity, okay? Um, and uh, along with that, I guess I want to say, oh, crap, I had it on the tip of my tongue. So you want to turn, be in position, all that good stuff. Um, you know, be aware of what's under your feet in that same scenario. You know, don't go snapping twigs and stuff while you're turning to shoot and draw. Um, but you're not invisible no matter what you're wearing. And, oh, I know what I was going to say. <clears throat> so I wear gloves most of the time when I hunt. I do have a, I call it a head condom, but a head covering that I may or may not have on. Like the la last two years, it's been in the mid-90s when I've been hunting. I'm not wearing anything on my face. Screw that. 
Um, and, you know, a baseball cap with a brim kind of pulled down low. Uh, I, you know, I got scruff that I let go for, you know, a couple of weeks or whatever, and so I got a little bit of a beard or whatever. Um, that's about all I do. I don't put camo makeup on. I don't, um, you know, face paint or whatever. I don't wear a head net most of the time. Um, I, you know, I do wear gloves often especially in the mornings when it's cool so if you're going to do that make sure you try and practice shooting your bow with the gloves on because your feel is different how you grip your bow is different um and uh and also like your wrist strap that you put on for your release is going to be sized different if you have a pair of gloves on so just be aware of all those things um and then also uh but, like, last year, you know, I shot my bull at, like, noon, maybe? Somewhere around there. Noon, one. It was 95 degrees. I, so, I, I don't wear a t-shirt when I hunt. I wear a long sleeve t-shirt and just roll up the sleeves, because that way I got a two-in-one kind of a deal. I mean, my, my arm, just how I am, tanned arm, arms bare, hands bare, everything was bare. I was dying, you know, it's super hot. Uh, we had just walked, I don't know, half, three quarters of a mile through a bunch of blowdown timber and, and thick timber and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I was super, super hot. So I had a white face, you know, tan, white, whatever you want to say, arms, hands, whatever. Um, and we were, my wife and I, we were both together, um, kind of similar, similarly set up. And we were standing in the middle of an elk trail. We weren't really in cover. We weren't really anything. Um, you know, the calf that came in originally, he was just a calf, not, not very smart, not wise to the ways of the world. You know, he, even so much so that he came in on our back trail, right downwind of us, you know, so what, uh, it was, it was a cool experience. Um, got to meet it, you know, check him out and whatever else. And, um, and he didn't really know what was going on. It was kind of cool. But then the bull, when he came in, he was upwind from us. Uh, 22 yards, he was looking our direction, looking for that calf that was making all the noise, and, um, <clears throat> I mean, we were both just standing in the middle of the trail, um, uh, fully exposed, fully everything, but because he had no clue that we were even there, um, all I had to do was time my shot for when he wasn't looking straight at me, so the second he turned his head and looked a different direction, I drew, took my shot, um, if I can get the video, my wife videoed it, um, on her phone, and right at my shot, she, like, switched from one shoulder, from over one shoulder of me to the other shoulder, so it kind of, um, didn't come out so great, but if I can get that video to, if I can figure out how to incorporate it into this video, I'll put it up, it's only, like, 40 seconds or something like that, I mean, it's literally just the shot sequence, but you can see me come up, I almost draw, I decide not to, and then a half second later I draw at a more opportune time. I take my time, I, I center everything, I shoot, and then as soon as that arrow releases and I watch it hit, then I go down, immediately grab my next arrow, put it in as that animal is running away, waiting to see if it will stop somewhere where I got a second clean shot, because I believe you just keep shooting at every opportunity you get until the animal either runs from you to the point where you can't shoot, or the animal's down and dead, so. Anyways, <laughs> long story short, camel clothing does not keep you 100% hidden. Um, it's not the magic cure-all, but it does solve a lot of problems. So check it out. Um, you know, any brand will do. I, I, most of the clothing nowadays are 
very similarly built and designed and function very, very similarly. So it doesn't really matter what brand you have. I don't have a lot of name brand stuff. I mix match stuff all the time. Whatever works, whatever's cheapest that I can find on sale somewhere, whatever. The elk don't care if you're head to toe one brand name or another. So anyways, there you go. So that's the end of uh, my videos here. This one was a little bit long, 35 minutes. Sorry. Um, and if I add that elk video in here, it'll be just a little bit longer. But um, hopefully you guys found some good information in all of this. Uh, if you want more of this kind of stuff, Give me some topics. Give me something specific you have a question about. Um, I'm not the end-all, be-all, you know, encyclopedia of knowledge here. I think I'm a very analytical person, so um, I, I observe a lot. I do a lot of logical thinking. And so if I have an, a personal experience that I can relate to a question, I sure will, you know, give that information best I see fit to you. Um, I have no secrets or anything like that. I'm still learning. I am not the great and powerful Oz of elk hunting. Most people look at me and still think I'm a, a I'm an idiot that don't that doesn't know anything, and they're they're probably right. So um, the information I'm giving you is just what I think is going to help you out the best. So if you have a question about anything, I'd be happy to answer it and make some more videos for you guys. Um, focusing on those questions, answering those questions, but also providing you with some good tasty notes on some delicious whiskey, something to go out and try. So um, there you go. Drop your comment down below. Give me your two cents, your feedback, whatever you think. Let me know what you can find the John Barr Reserve Black Label for in your area. As I said, here in Wyoming, $19.39. Um, pretty good drinker I for a scotch as a person who is not really a scotch fan. I'll drink it all day long. Um, you know, like, subscribe, share this video. Um, you know, give me a thumbs down, give me a thumbs up, whatever you think, um, and any other comments you have. And um, anyways, thank you so much for watching this video and all the videos in the continuation of this series or the revisiting of the How to Hunt Elk series. And um, I hope you guys found some good information here. Thanks for watching. Have yourselves a great day. I will catch you guys in the next video or video series. I haven't decided what I'm doing yet. Have a great day.